And um, I want to um, welcome you to the fourth presentation in our Ed Talk series, which is, as you know, I mean, you're all regulars now, it's an opportunity for our teachers to share with you, the broader Vaughan community, um, what floats their academic boats, to be honest. Uh, I think in this day and age when schools have so many social issues on their plate, and rightly so, incidentally, um, but I think it's good to remind ourselves from time to time that we are, first and foremost, we're seats of learning. And it's therefore nice to luxuriate um, in academics from time to time. So you've heard about epic poetry from me, um, the trope of the transgressive female in literature from Sheila O'Connell, um, and geography as geostrategy from David Godwin, which is obviously quite a mix. But now, of course, having done the arts and the social sciences, it's now high time to move into the realm of the hard science. science. So I'm delighted to introduce to you this evening, Katrina McGrath, chemistry teacher extraordinaire, who's made quite an impression in her three years at the Vaughan, and incidentally, uh, whose family has a long and distinguished uh, connection with the school through the generations. So, for example, um, Katrina's um, father came here, um, brother came here. Um, when did your father come, Katrina? Was it 1923? Yeah. yeah 1923. So that, that is a long and distinguished. Uh, I'm just, I've just done the math. That's a 98 year connection you've got with the school. So your father came here, Katrina, and your son's here and you teach here. So <laughs> welcome to Cardinal Vaughan. Um, and we all know that there's more to chemistry than hanging bits of string in copper sulfate solution and watching crystals grow. Uh, speaking personally, I've never forgotten the magic of seeing those beautiful blue crystals all those years ago. And let's not forget magnesium ribbon. We all love magnesium ribbon and we loved that when we started chemistry. But the question Katrina is going to address is not the start of chemistry, but whether chemistry ever ends. And I'm delighted, therefore, to pass over to her. So if you've got any questions arise during the course of this presentation, please use the chat function and they'll be WhatsApped over to me and I'll put them, over, put them to Katrina after her talk. And with that, let's put an end to, to me and learn from Katrina whether there's an end to chemistry. So Katrina, thank you and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I, it's very, uh, very nice to be speaking this evening. Thank you for coming. And um, I wanted to just uh, position chemistry in, in a nice way and uh, just maybe try and link it to a bit of everyday life. So I hope you, you'll enjoy that. Um, so uh, in 2019, uh, a provocative book was published, uh, which said that chemistry was pretty much there now. We understood everything, 80% of the possible reactions have been done, um, and there was just little left to do now. Um, that wasn't all the author said, but uh, it was a view that could be taken and uh, perhaps a bit of a shocking one that uh, sh should we stop now? Um, but uh, chemists, uh, despite the publication of this book, they didn't just close their fume cupboards and go off and do something else. Um, the chemists and the next generation coming up are still interested in doing great things. They're still there, still in the lab, but also everywhere. Um, I took a straw poll in, of the lower six in my class the other day. I gave them half an hour to read all the chemistry review back numbers from the library. And then I just asked them, if you were doing chemical research, where would you see yourself? Uh, would it be on land, in the air, um, in the ocean or in space? And space won. Uh, just beating oceans. So they really um, had their sights far and wide, which was absolutely great. Um, but that the question uh, that the book was talking about, you know, what is there left to do? Um, I'd like to consider it with you and just to think about what might be uh, the things that chemists do, but also um, how chemistry sits in the field of science as a whole and with maths really. I'd like to put, a for, put forward a view really that um, the science of stuff, as Richard Feynman described it, um, is something that everybody's going to need wherever they go and whatever science they're doing in just as fundamental a way as maths is fundamental. Um, a big claim, uh, but um, much of maths is known, 
um, and much of chemistry is known, and just we can then use it to do new interesting things. So let me start to um, talk um, for, for you about a few of the interesting things, old and new. Um, and I thought we might start in the kitchen. Uh, because you have probably had the chance to be doing a bit of your own experimentation recently with maybe a little bit more time to spend on it than you would have had in the past. But just before I crack into that, I'm just going to close a blind because I can see that my face has gone into a, one bright quadrant and three dark ones. So I'm just going to go and do that. Excuse me. Is that better? Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so we were going to go in the kitchen. Um, and I, you, the famous chef Heston Blumenthal is a real favourite of mine um, because um, he has a really good chemistry connection. I know that uh, you, you, you've probably heard of him, um, but also I, I wonder if you knew that he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And he's um, went and uh, became a fellow and started to um, talk about how he could uh, explain chemistry in the kitchen to students and I do actually use some of his videos in class about things like um, pineapple jelly and, and some of those things that have now got into the world of molecular gastronomy which um, I don't know whether you've, you've uh, had some interesting uh, scrapes with molecular gastronomy I know I have in science club some of it works better than others I would say um, but he himself was influenced by one particular scientist who came to the UK to study super cold um, temperatures in physics. Um, yeah, so Nicholas Curti, uh, who um, did a lecture back in 1969 called um, A Physicist in the Kitchen. Uh, and what he did was uh, he explained various aspects of both the sort of molecule side of cooking, but also some physical side of cooking. So the example that the, the Physics Today wanted to talk about was, uh, uh, as you can see, a reverse baked Alaska. So he had a microwave which not only um, had a turntable and uh, you could heat the food evenly because it was turning around on the plate, but this particular microwave was tuned so that the beams were crossing at a certain point so that you could have the baked Alaska being hot on the inside and cold on the outside, which must have been fascinating. I would have loved to see that. Um, so, uh, one of, so on the molecular side of things, one of the examples that he gave that really struck me was about um, the similarity of several flavours where um, you've got one molecule which seems to be doing the same or, or, or almost the same job in several different plants. And the example that he gave was basil. Now, basil has um, a molecule in it which has a, a ring of carbon atoms and a few chains of carbon atoms sticking off the ring. And Anseed also has a very, very similar molecule. Um, in fact, there's only one small difference and uh, even A-level chemists might be able to work out how to um, react the molecule and then uh, change between the basil flavor and the aniseed flavor. Um, because the only difference is one carbon-carbon double bond, which has moved one place to the right or left. That's it, that's it, that's the only difference. Um, but that's sort of on the molecular scale and understanding it on molecular scale. But as it happens, Italian cooks have, have always known or would pass down from um, person to person through the generations. Um, the fact that if your basil um, flavor isn't really doing it in your dish, then you can you can add in a pinch of aniseed, which is not something I'd ever heard of or thought of before, because I tend to use basil and aniseed in quite different dishes at home. But it is that's that's what happens. Aniseed can give your basil flavor a boost. So who, who knew? Uh, but uh, well, Italians did. Um, but uh, so Raymond Blanc worked with Nicolas Curti and they did a French television series about cooking. And uh, there's another scientist called Hervé Thys, um, who and uh, who's uh, still publishing. And I think people get together and they do experiments and report back on the niceties of when to add your corn flour into your sauce or whatever it is and do some experiments on that. Um, and then there's a blog which I absolutely loved called Kaimos, where there's better photographs than Hermetis's uh, thing, which is uh, full of uh, uh, research papers without enough photos for me. Um, so that, that's terribly interesting. So for some flavour molecules, that's it. It's just a small change in the structure. 
But actually, uh, in combination with uh, some examples from living systems, lots of living systems, there is a possibility that you can get two flavors from just one chemical structure. And the reason why that can occur is because of a phenomenon known as chirality. And it's, it's this. So um, here are my hands. The word chiral comes from the word uh, Greek word for hand. I'm very pleased to be able to use a, a tiny smattering of Greek in, in this lecture, seeing as a, it's a, it seems to be a, a wonderful thing to follow on from. Thank you. Uh, so um, the, my two hands here, if I tried to, I could say superimpose them, just actually meld them into one hand, it's, it's just never, go never going to work. It's, they're always going to be mirror images of each other. And lots of molecules are just the same. They have exactly the same structure, so thumb and four fingers, but at the same time, they're they, they are different from each other if you include the fact that they are mirror images. Now, um, in, in, in biological systems, uh, uh, most uh, plant, most of the, the chiral molecules would, would not fit into a certain part of, of the structure of, of a cell or something because of this mirror image property that they have. But the funny thing is that there's also uh, an, an overbalance of the sort of left-handed type of molecules. Now, when I say left-handed, I don't mean that they've got a thumb or anything like that. What it is, is that um, these molecules rotate polarized light in a certain direction. And so if, if you're looking head on at your light beam and you, and you can see that the angle of the polaroid that you, you're letting it through has gone from one side to the other. We call it left-handed and right-handed, clockwise or anti-clockwise, or dextro-rotatory and levo-rotatory. So yeah, but there's many nomenclatures because it's old chemistry. But some people say that the reason why in biomolecules, quite often, there's a, a preponderance of left-handed versions, some people suggest that that's because some of the initial building blocks of life, perhaps amino acids, for example, may have arrived from space in one exclusive version, the left-handed version. And then when more and more life developed after that, it's possible that that's the reason why there is this preponderance of left-handed versions around the place in cells, but we don't know. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of chiral flavor molecules. So just um, taking a look at the top there, we see the, the, the plant that they come from, so caraway see seeds and spearmint, and the name of the molecule is carvone, and I've done the plus and minus notation because I, th I think that's the one that um, A-level students will recognize um, most. Um, and you can see the two uh, mole molecular structures here. I might need to just explain just briefly what you're looking at. Um, as, as you can see, there's a hexagon, and there's also some C's and some H's and some O's and some sticks and a, a, a sort of dashed line and a, a triangular sort of wedge. Now, what that what the um, hexagon means, some of the carbons aren't shown in this structure, but really it's a ring of six carbons. But because that's so common um, and also so messy to write, um, the, the carbons have just been replaced with just angle changes on, on that hexagon. I hope that's OK. Um, and then you can see the sticks. So those are either single bonds or double bonds. And then the wedge thing, that means that the hydrogen atom is actually coming out of the plane of your screen and sort of coming towards you a bit, whereas the dashed line is going back away from the screen. So that's the really important part for the mirror image, because what's what's actually happening is that um, the carbon atom, which has the, the wedge and the dash and the two other sticks sticking out, it's got four different things attached to it. And that's enough to make the molecule have a hand handedness. Um, and so we have the two mirror images here. And one, the one smells and tastes like caraway, and the other smells and tastes like spearmint, which again, I, I always thought of as very, very different flavors. And, 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 and the reasoning behind it is simply that when it reaches our nose, one mirror image does one, goes to one receptor, gets detected by one receptor in your nose, and the other one goes to another receptor um, or is detected by another receptor. And so we have different flavors from one molecular structure. Um, 
our sense of taste doesn't really stop there with with structures of molecules some people are still sort of analyzing how much the bond vibrations when they reach your nose receptors um, have an impact on on flavor and and also what the molecule will dissolve in is absolutely critical for flavor too um, and as you uh, i'm sure you've tested a, a lot um, there's a big big difference in how you use spices in a recipe uh, for example, does a flavour dissolve better in water or oil? So, for example, tomatoes can taste totally different with um, some oil, extra oil in the recipe because you're kind of unlocking the potential of a molecule that will dissolve better in oil than it will in water. Um, which is very similar to, I mean, it's the same molecule for deep heat and uh, ulvous oil, I think, but uh, one dissolves in oil and one um, and goes through your skin, therefore, and another preparation um, doesn't. Um, so, uh, yeah, aspirin going into your stomach, for example, needs to dissolve in water, not, not in oil. Um, and then also the temperature that you're using your molecules, super important. So for example, I don't know whether you've tried uh, putting your spices in, in a pan, which is being heated to quite a high temperature, but, but without any oil in it. And then you grind them up and it makes everything smell wonderful. Um, that is just a, the technique that you're using there is to, uh, is to check on, uh, is to make use of how volatile, how easily a, a molecule will turn into a gas. Um, so you can change your molecules ever so slightly by giving them different levels of heat. So I wonder whether you might like to try an experiment one day if people in your house are ever eating sweets these days. Um, Starburst or a similar um, sweet, which is available, um, which is wrapped up and comes in fruit flavours, um, is you can do a really, um, really funny experiment if you've got some people around so that you can have maybe some audience members and you can also have some guinea pigs and what you need to do is to blindfold your guinea pigs and, and get them to guess the flavor and what what it is this this experiment really really shows just how important experimental controls are um, and also just how much influ influence the researcher can have on their own results so um, what, what you would do if you were going to run this one um, just for fun is uh, get, get your um, subjects to be blindfolded um, and show the audience the starburst that you're about to give them. And then you give it to your, uh, your guinea pigs and they open up the starburst, put it in their mouths and start to chew it and taste it. And then you tell them, you ask them what flavor it is. And even though their nose is not, not covered or, or concealed or, at all, um, they find it really difficult to get the right flavor. So smell is a very, very tricky thing. And uh, your eyesight seems to have a big influence. Another slightly creepier thing that you can do, um, which I think um, uh, three-year-olds would, would either love or hate perhaps, um, is uh, when you change the color of some food and maybe dye it blue <laughs> um, because there are so few blue foods um, sometimes it can really freak people out and they think the taste is really gone and things like that whereas it's just it's just blue now um, so very very uh, um, uh, tricky to, to pin down what what scent and flavor involve and chemistry is only part of the picture um, it wasn't until the late 1990s that some, some work that began to bear fruit um, on how our noses even work. Um, and uh, the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine 2004 um, was the, the time when this, uh, this work on, on how our noses work was, was, was awarded, rewarded um, with recognition for finding 10,000 genes that each code for the proteins required to build one nasal receptor. So one gene, one receptor times 10,000 that were characterized. And I, again, it, it's, not, it's, it's unusual for a gene only to code for one thing. So how our nose is developed to have this specialization and also to have just so many receptors is incredible, I think. Um, the, the latest chemical noses, so an artificial mammalian nose would be a real, a real a wonderful thing to have around, whether you are working in a port or working on some flavors or perfume or whatever it is, it'd be a great thing to have. But 
as sophisticated as our research is, people are still building them in the lab. Um, they're still quite um, still at the research and development stage. Um, one of the latest ones is simply a big lineup, a big array of lots and lots of proteins to try and activate as, um, for as many different uh, flavors as possible and scents as possible. Uh, yeah, so we'll say goodbye to the kitchen for a while and um, just sort of go into the lab and put our lab coats on and safety glasses and, and what have you. Um, and lab work in general, I, I always laugh about this spelling mistake that one of my students uh, wrote once, uh, which I thought characterised lab work memorably. Um, and that, that was, he said, heat the substance until the mess stops changing. Heat the mixture until the mess stops changing, he said. So I thought that was um, uh, very, very, very good. Yeah, keep going. You, you should be a chemist. Um, but the reality is that uh, now we do actually have the chance to look at reactions while they're happening using um, laser spectroscopy and uh, microscopes that can lay down it's a, a sort of a, a force, a force can be applied to a single atom under a microscope that can lay down individual atoms one by one on a surface. So all of the things like making alloys, those are the kind of things which now are taking, coming right away from the kind of witchcraft and, and wisdom, like folk wisdom that, uh, that uh, uh, was was how alloys were, were made and, and tested and built and designed for so long and really it is uh, turning into a world of designer alloys and other materials um, and uh, although I don't know very much about it um, chlorine atoms individual chlorine atoms are some of the atoms that have been used to start doing quantum computing um, there was a great April Fool about this, uh, um, about uh, some a, quant a quantum computer that started uh, running Zoom with people like being muted and unmuted at the same time. So I think we'll stay clear of that for now. And the origin of laboratory work. Well, it's a long time away from um, Heston Blumenthal. And I, I'm actually I've put this slide on because I'm wondering about uh, running with the sixth form, like the lower six after after um, the half term, it's possible we'll have enough space to do this, um, is to run a tallest jelly competition. I think if we give, give the sixth form four packs of jelly and a few rules to follow, I'd, I'd really love to do that. But the origins of, of chemistry, um, without all the, the chances to um, replicate and, and make sure that we had a, a, a kind of formal scientific method, really take us back at least three or 4,000 years ago and archeological evidence of what it was that the Egyptians were doing. And the actual etymology of the word chemistry itself and I was very happy to see that um, the ancient Egyptians and their contribution to chemistry is remembered in the word uh, chemistry because it's thought that its origin is the word chem, which also means black land, black soil. Um, the riches of the Nile also included chemical riches. So although they were a little bit behind with bronze, so many of the natural resources, oh, and tin, yeah, that was, tin was what they, what they lacked to make bronze. Um, but uh, all the other natural resources that were available made the, uh, made the in, uh, early, early chemical studies and uses of, of uh, um, in Egypt, very, very, uh, uh, really rich. Um, some archaeological evidence that really uh, interested me was uh, for metallurgy, uh, but also you know, the, the very first chemical uh, synthetic dye was a, an indigo dye that came out of uh, um, a, a few drops of, of uh, um, whelk juice and some um, other plant dyes. That was what the first uh, dye stuff that was uh, um, we, we have evidence for being uh, synthesized. Um, but uh, the one that interested me about, about metallurgy was that um, they were silversmiths and they, they were able to smelt silver. And the way that they did it they, um, to get purer and purer silver was to try and remove the silver from the lead that was also in the same mineral um, seam in some rocks. And the way they did it was to use some ash from burning bones and press it into a sort of cup shape like that, 
um, and then um, react the lead silver oxygen rocky stuff um, at a high and as a higher temperature as they could by using bellows to provide extra oxygen for the fire and everything like that. Um, and what would happen is that the lead and the silver stuff would melt and the lead would actually and the oxygen would actually react with the 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 cupel I think that's the way to pronounce it um this this sort of cup thing and then when the reaction had finished you'd open it up and there would be a bead of silver pure silver right in the middle and then they they pour that away and make it make whatever silver beautiful things that they were going to make um and then they'd have to pop out the like the sort of cylinder of of the sort of lead oxide bone char stuff and they chucked it away and like so much archaeology what what you find in the rubbish was was the bit that was really interesting because over time they got better at it and so you can see that the rubbish heaps that are more recent they've got better purification on the silver and you can almost even tell where they're getting some of their um, materials from in the world in the ancient world um, so that you can you can analyze what they left behind with these little sort of pop outs and throw away uh, uh, cupel molds, which is which is a, a, a lovely piece of archaeology or, or chemical archaeology. So the trading and conquering civilizations came uh, came came later and, and drew upon these riches, which were very much. I mean, I haven't mentioned mummification at all, but one of the main drivers for being a good chemist in those times was to make sure that your dead were prepared for the afterlife as well as possible. So this was really considered sacred knowledge. Um, and so unless people were suspicious and burnt the books, uh, then the, the, the civilizations that came later were able to add to and develop this knowledge, but it still had this, um, this inspiration of being the, the science of, of the black land. Um, and so that's a lovely way to remember it. Um, and also about bronze, um, some people say that the Persians beat the Egyptians because the Egyptians had hung on to their copper tools um, and weapons technology just that little bit too long. Um, but then after the Persians arrived, that bronze bronze manufacture did start in Egypt. So they didn't they didn't hang around after they'd been conquered, they, they got on with it. Um, so, I mean, with, with all that uh, inheritance, I, I wonder sometimes what uh, what the Egyptians might have, have wanted to be the, the next big thing in chemistry, what they might have dreamed of doing. And in fact, today's chemists got together a few years back, about 2005, to say, OK, so what, what are the big things that we still have to do? What are the grandest challenges left? Um, and they came up with a big list. Uh, they called them the, the holy grails of, of, of chemistry. Um, and some of them, 15 years on, have been reviewed and found that actually, you know, artificial photosynthesis, we're getting nowhere with it. L let's do something else instead. Let's just concentrate on electrolysis to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. It's just going to be better than making artificial leaves. So that's one idea from 15 years ago that um, isn't attracting too much research endeavour at the moment. But um, I'll pick on just a, a few so that you can get a, a, an idea of, of what people are, are spending their time on in these big laboratories, perhaps the one up um, Wood Lane at White City, the new campus for um, Imperial College. By the way, chemistry was the first to go because all the embassies in South Kensington couldn't wait to see the back of this massive security risk that was Imperial College's chemistry department. Well, that, that's what somebody told me, I don't know. Um, but there's one chemical bond in particular which is a tough one to break with good like accuracy so to be able to select one particular bond and break just that one um and it's ch so you remember hydrocarbon fuels um so many organic molecules have loads and loads of carbons attached to loads and loads of hydrogens. I've got one um, here on screen, which I I'm, I'm sincerely hope that you can see, but I've, I've obviously put the, put the visual just too far to the right for some screens. If you can move it around so that you can see it, I, I do hope. Um, but um, as you can see on the left, we have um, in, in the upper picture, we've got dopamine, uh, which is a neurotransmitter. 
um, and it's uh, involved in many different functions in the brain, but it has a it has quite a reputation for being uh, something that is a reward neurotransmitter. And then we have norepinephrine, which is very, very closely related in structure. And on top of the arrow um, and underneath the arrow, you, it gives a little bit of an explanation about how you change from one to another. So neurotransmitters are very economical. OK, so unlike nose proteins, uh, neurotransmitters are great because you can change from one to another, which will give a different chemical signal, which can do multiple jobs inside the brain. And uh, you can get rid of them fairly efficiently and you can make them fairly efficiently provided you're, you're well. Um, and uh, so the, the, the changing between the them, um, is done by enzymes very efficiently. But um, I, I hope you can spot the difference between dopamine and norepinephrine, that we have this one OH that is attached on that sort of pointy up bit. Now, the pointy up bit would have two hydrogens, and then it's changed to have one hydrogen and one OH stuck on it. And I don't even just love enzyme names. This one's called dopamine beta monooxygen A's. So it's called A's because it's an enzyme. There it goes. Um, now, the body can do this really well, but in the lab, just getting hold of chopping that CH in that exact place, even for small molecules like this, I say small, relatively small molecules, um, is really difficult. Um, and the U lab is, is, is working. CH activation is one of those ones which attracts much, a great deal of research effort, possibly out of all the um, 2005 Holy Grail list. This is the one that is attracting the most attention because the desire to be able to chop and add and build organic molecules, not only for biomolecules, but also for um, other applications as well, is just such a desire. Um, it would just uh, allow us to do so much. Um, so uh, the, as you can see, there's, this is sort of fairly complicated molecule with lots of rings stuck together, which is very um, typical of, of things like um, estrogen and um, testosterone, for example, have multiple rings stuck together. Um, so the way to do this, how, how do we do this? How, how do we mimic enzymes? Well, enzymes are the biological version of what we call catalysts. So that's something that speeds up a reaction, but is still there at the end. Um, and most of them are based on either transition metals in the middle of the periodic table or in another metal with things stuck on. So quite often they have the name of, of, of crab, crab claws. Um, so they, they're sometimes called ligands, but sometimes we, we say that they are bidentate or monodentate because they, 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 can, um, they can bite on to a metal atom. And it's actually designing those attachments to your catalyst's metal ion that is making all the difference for, for the U, U lab. That's, that's what they, they want to do. But there are so many other groups around the world who are taking lots of different approaches to this. But if, if you hear in the news that somebody has found a way of selectively chopping CH in half, then they are really onto something. So perhaps uh, yeah, you could buy their shares or whatever. I don't know. Um, all right, then. So it's that the, the catalysts can can do their job very well because they're there at the end, which means that whatever happens to them in, in the um, at the start, um, afterwards, it, it either reverses or it, they're changed back in some way. So I don't know whether um, you've come across the idea of reversible reactions. So things where you, um, you, you start with two things, um, maybe they react, you, you, make, you make a product, but then actually some of it just goes back and starts being the reactants again. So to, in some ways, that's a, that's a disadvantage because you're never going to get 100% of your yield of your product. But at the same time, we, we've got to have reversible reactions because sometimes the energy balance between two situations is very close. Or we might want to um, just go back to the beginning so that we can do something else again, like with catalysts. So reversible reactions are very, very valuable to us. And an example of how we can use a reaction that can um, stop, start, maybe be controlled by us, or maybe just go on its own, following as if it was following a little program, is the idea of making robots out of DNA or another long chain molecule. And so the state of the art at the moment is, um, I'll, I'll show you this slide here, might need a little bit of um, ex, ex, explanation, but the Chiang group published this image 
of some DNA that was taken from a virus that attacks bacteria called a phage. And they took these kind of hairpins of DNA and they, they slotted them together to make a, a sort of base plate. Like, you know, when, when you're lucky enough to have enough Lego to, to um, ask for a base plate for Christmas and uh, it's hard to wrap up, but it's very important to your Lego build. And then on top here, there's a sort of environment for a DNA robot to walk around. So this DNA robot um, paper was a, about describing how a, a, a few lengths of DNA could operate in several steps independently. You just set it going, it does it to do some sorting, some tidying. So this surface has randomly uh, um, attached to it, um, some orange ones and some green ones. So some molecules which are orange and some molecules which are green. And the robot had the job of going around the surface to find them, then picking them up, carrying them to a depot for orange and a depot for green. So you can see that it's it's a it's not a very a random process in this picture. All, all, all the all the ones that they have to go and collect are at one end. But um, all those all those game shows where you have to pick up some water and take it to another place and pour it into this little robot is doing this job. And it could be to keep a surface super clean or it could be to identify some kind of invading um, uh, thing that you didn't want in a cell, perhaps. Um, and like I said, the, the, the state of the art is improving all the time. Um, but at the moment, on a two-dimensional surface, little, this little robot um, made out of a, a few strands of DNA can, can take 300 steps in its program in, uh, along its own algorithm um, before it, it has to stop. So they've got, they've got that far. Um, DNA may not even be the best thing to make them out of. I mean, you can imagine that if you wanted it to pick up something that was magnetic, then you might want to use a molecule which had really good magnetic properties that you selected. Or you might want it to have the best electronic properties, so a charge that was localized in one part of, of your robot or something like that, so that it could, it could lift and drop things in a different way. Um, and so provided you've got a reaction that can go into reverse and forward, then you can even have a ro robot that has a forward gear and a reverse gear. Um, so um, it's now time to, to think about where we're getting all these fantastic chemicals from to make new things. Um, and our sources of, of chemicals are, are going to change significantly. Um, in my classes, I, I tell students that that their generation will not think of few, uh, crude oil and coal as, as their default place to go to get organic molecules. Um, so th there was no question about it. But when I learned organic chemistry, that's where they all came from. They came from crude oil. But I'm encouraging students to think now and for going forward that they, they, they won't, but they, they'll get them from all sorts of places. And I really, really hope that that's true. Um, Let's take an example of, of latex used to make rubber. Now, um, there are not very many species of rubber tree. In fact, uh, there's a bit of a monoculture situation across the world. So just like bananas, there's very, very low genetic diversity in the hevia tree, which is on the left in the pictures. Um, so with that issue that means that the, the trees themselves are vulnerable, vulnerable to things like leaf blight and things like that and, it, and in 2019 the total um, production of, of, of latex in those big flat sheets um, it, it, in 2019 dropped by a million tons so 14 million tons of rubber went down by a million tons because of leaf blight and so there are two species and a bit of uh, old wartime technology that uh, may be being, uh, in, uh, being used more. And there's a, a, a Central American shrub there, um, which is, can grow in really tough environments. Um, and that's being researched in California, Mexico and other countries at the moment. And it's called, I think it's Huayul um, shrub. And that has a latex in it. Now, the, the reason why plants have latex is so that they can, I learned this at Kew Gardens. Um, so, you can um when the latex comes out the mandibles of any biting insects get stuck in it so it's a very bad place to have your lunch if you're an insect and then on the bottom right on the screen you can see um the kazakh dandelion which is um kazakh kazakhstan a wonderful place to find things that are bigger or better or older or more fantastic a, a traditional chewing gum 
uh, but during the Second World War and onwards, um, the, the latex was used when um, imports of, of uh, latex from uh, Southeast Asia um, came into doubt. Um, so that is a, a technology from back, uh, back then, um, which might uh, provide a type of rubber which is uh, sort of low um, in, in fault. In, in the sheets have a, a small number of faults in the design in, in there uh, when they're made um, from the dandelions and from the Mexican um, shrub. Um, so that would be really, really good for biodiversity and to, to make sure that the, the production of rubber is more sustainable. Um, reversible reactions, speaking of reversible reactions, once the rubber is vulcanized, so made hard with sulfur, the, the chains have been joined together with sulfur atoms. It's really, really difficult to reverse that reaction. And so trying to recycle meltdown rubber or anything like that, a very, very difficult thing to do. So um, supply is, is, is still something that's very important. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so um, re recycling might, might come later. That might be something that chemists can do later, but we can't, we can't recycle rubber very easily now. Uh, so chemicals. Where they are in the world really matters. And you know and I know that chemicals really spread out around the world. Wherever we've grown them, whatever we've used them for, say they might have been being used for a fuel or being used to make a school shirt or a sheet of rubber or a rubber glove or whatever it is. Before you know it, they've gone somewhere completely different and they're doing something completely different. It might be in the ocean or it might be in the air. And we, we sometimes we're very, very bad at knowing what they'll do next, chemicals that we make. Um, and also, we're also, we're, on the other hand, we're, we're very good at treating such events as external costs that don't appear on any balance sheets. Um, and so the, the, there's a, a, new, a new accounting system that was uh, in, in uh, some Dasgupta in, uh, in Cambridge was uh, leading a review on the idea of having a sort of accounting system uh, that governments and uh, industry might be able to use where you, you can put a price on your resource before you actually use it. Um, so to have the idea of a sort of uh, uh, sort of natural capital was, was a nice idea, I thought. Um, chemists also have the idea of, of atom economy, which means how many atoms did you put in and how many did you actually use for your product and how many atoms did you throw away? So you can sort of calculate an atom economy. And all of these things are so, so important. Um, and Chemist labs aren't isolated. We 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 try we try uh, and and explain that and and uh, and keep it in mind, but with a wider question, which I can put to you, um, how, how can we learn about the world uh, if the world is taken out of our learning? So if we if we ever feel that we're drawn to something which seems to be very esoteric, can we can we question ourselves to make sure that we are taking account of what happened before? during and after, and what are the potential um, potential costs attached to that. Um, so knowing your chemistry should be able to help you make better decisions um, and to reduce climate change in particular and to protect life forms from its effects. Um, but does, does chemistry offer realistic chances um, to change our lives for the better? D does it, or sh should we just stop doing the bad stuff? It's sometimes it's tempting to, 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 to blame uh, chemists for, for things. And I know that um, like from Erin Brockovich and other films onwards, it's, it's, it's something where, you know, yes, we, uh, perhaps chemistry has a lot to learn and a lot to think about. Um, I really hope that we're all getting better at um, you know, metanoia, the, the ability to change our minds. And I, I, just as much as everybody else, I hope that chemists can, can be those, those people who can change their minds. Um, one example that I had to change my mind about was, was the idea that you can have a fuel, burn it, and then turn, it, turn what the products of burning are back into a fuel, so reversing combustion. Now, I always thought of that as, as irreversible as frying an egg, that you just can't change it back. Um, but there is a catalyst that's in, in development. And if you hear the names of the, of the metals, iron, manganese, and potassium, so we can have those in our body without keeling over. They, they, these, these are not metals that are um, either too, in, in terrible shortage or um, very toxic. But a catalyst has been made to try and do that very process. I'm, I'm gonna say it again, bacteria can, can turn carbon 
carbon, di carbon dioxide or many other small molecules of carbon into long chains of carbon. They, they, they do that down in the bottom of the oceans in thermal trenches and things like that, the thermal vents in trenches. Um, but we are struggling to learn how to join carbons from carbon dioxide or other small molecules into chains that could be a fuel again to close the loop of, of releasing carbon dioxide and making carbon dioxide, uh, making a, and making a fuel so Oxford University's Benjen group in 2020, they've announced that they reckon they can get carbon dioxide from a, from a lab source, not, not from an actual fuel, but they, they're running a rig at Heathrow Airport, so there's hope. So um, they converted a third of the carbon dioxide that they pumped in, and of that one third, they converted half of it into chains between eight and 16 carbons long, so like kerosene. Um, so that is so poor compared with the ability of the natural world. So of course, other groups are just saying, well, don't, don't just start with a chemical catalyst. Why don't we harness the ability of bacteria to do such a thing? So there are many, many avenues to try this. Um, and mimicking biological systems or harnessing biological systems is certainly something that um, chemists would need to be able to provide information to biologists in order to be able to do that job better. Um, we're just at the start of the ability of some of the natural world for that. Um, and on Mars now, let's have a look at the Perseverance rover. So this is the latest rover to arrive on Mars, and you might have heard about its little helicopter um, taking its first flight, the first um, powered flight on a different planet this week. Um, but um, I'm always very pleased by this, which is that uh, the, um, the Perseverance rover has uh, seven different sort of chemical experiments or tools on board, and uh, four of them are chemical ones. So you see this big arm pointing towards us on this uh, uh, visual here. Um, it's got some tools which are, um, that, that, which are designed to look at rocks in detail in the same way that the rocks were looked at with x-ray uh, luminescence, which is how they discovered that uh, the rocks from Stonehenge um, were actually set up in Wales initially first. So the way that they um, discovered that was was using x-ray luminescence so you can see that it's just about to take a drill sample there um, and it's got a laser which can clear away debris um, at a distance as well as having to drill out samples so they're trying to find out a lot more about the rocks there um, and then there's uh, there's a part of it is called Sherlock um, and it has a little camera called Watson attached they love acronyms at NASA um, and Sherlock is particularly good at looking for organic chemicals that are locked up in rocks and Watson then comes along and takes some good photos of them. And then there's an experiment which, like I said, it's, it's sort of mimicking photosynthesis, but, but more to do with sort of uh, generating carbon dioxide, taking carbon dioxide and generating oxygen to make the stuff to make a fuel to get home. And that experiment is called MOXIE. Um, and that is named for um, some Native American technology of, about, uh, um, about growing plants to um, get oxygen and things like that. So that's quite, kind of nice. Um, so I hope you've um, enjoyed hearing about some of these ways that chemistry is, is melding into uh, all, all of the many, many scientific endeavors that we have. Um, uh, just just at one statistic about uh, the modern uh, molecular biology uh, at, at the moment the medical research council has a place called the laboratory of molecular biology in cambridge and and while people have been researching there they've won 12 nobel prizes now and nine of them were for chemistry so that's pretty pretty good going um as long as I, as long as I, I feel, as long as we can um, be prepared to change our minds and to work alongside um, the, the, uh, and support all the different endeavors of scientists, I feel that chemistry has got that lovely fundamental role that people can turn to and find out more about what stuff is getting up to, how it's joining together, what's happening at the surface of your stuff, um, and how different bits of stuff can join together and break apart again and do it do it either unaided. Or or under supervision. So, so many different uh, avenues to explore. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this very brief tour um, of, of how, how we're getting on. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, uh, Katrina. And we've come a long way from stringing copper sulfate solution, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't mention those lovely blue things that uh, they made in uh, to, to decorate Egyptian mummy cases and things like that. So sarcophagi, I, I should have um, I should have mentioned that just for you. 
don't beat yourself up, Katrina. You did mention DNA robots. Um, <laughs> so that, that kind of outranks it. Now, um, a question that came through um, about of a third of the way into your into your talk, um, and it leapt out at me actually as well. So as soon as you said it, my ears pricked up. And anyway, the question was this, it came through, it said, could you please tell us more about the left-handed amino acids from space? All right, okay. So um, amino acids are, uh, are molecules which have um, things sticking out from carbon. Like I said, four things sticking out from a central carbon is a way to visualize amino acids. Now, unfortunately, I don't know which meteor it was that they thought might have had uh, the organic chemicals in it or when it landed. But what I do know is that people are going to look for it again. They're trying to find it, especially if any meteors come close, which they think have come from outside the um, solar system. You know, the Oort cloud, which is oh, yeah. Yeah. way beyond Pluto. So if anything, um, if they think that anything's come from there, um, people are, are, are setting up or to, to land something on it and drill it out and see if they can get any biomolecules to, to replicate this idea and actually to get the evidence for this idea. Because it's just an idea at the moment. I, I don't believe that any um actual um uh, there's there's no there's no smoking rock for that one i'm afraid but what 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 you're saying therefore and this is kind of me just sort of following that question up is that it is the case that it is entirely feasible that among the building blocks of the solar system currently sort of floating around in the ore cloud are lengthy amino acids um mm. well, got maybe May, let's say maybe two short amino acids joined together or maybe three okay but that, amino acid, that might be the size of it because, because as a layman you start off with an amino acid then you get a protein then you get life um um that that's a very very um, um a rapid rapid summary of um, yes <laughs> uh, but yeah 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 with a few, few extra bits and pieces added on yes yeah. That's a very polite way of dealing with, with my supplementary question, and I thank you for it. Um, now, um, taking your um, abilities to communicate and with tact on that occasion, another one came through. Um, and it goes, if you had less than one minute to persuade a pupil to study chemistry at A level over another subject, what would you say? And I'm sorry Ooh. if that sounds like an interview question. <laughs> well, luckily I had the warm up three years ago. No, it's... um. That no, it, it does. I would certainly be wanting to focus on what that person's interests were in order to find a good answer to that question, and just uh, just try and try and uh, float their boat in whatever way I, I was hoping to get from them. But if I if I had to start with with um, little knowledge, after checking whether they had to do chemistry for medicine and they really did need to make a choice, yeah, yeah. I might talk to them about the kind of skills involved in having a palette to work with and to find out all the questions that they had sort of known they were only getting half an answer to about how to use that palette, those 118, maybe more in the future, um, elements and how they can work together in such complicated ways. I, I do teach with physics quite a lot as well. So I, I would probably never get them to choose between chemistry and physics. I might just bow my head and say, if you think you should do physics, you go, you go. Um, but if it, if it was a, a, a thing where they they wanted to be able to explain much more and to be able to apply some logical thought and some pattern to, to build some patterns and to work with this this um this selection of materials and see what they could do with those um then i might i might take take that line as, as well as saying that they were they, they were going to um do things that might might be unexpected and interesting as well thanks katrina now the next <coughs> Two more questions have come through. We've got time for two more. Um, these are both big compliments to you, actually, I, I regard, because basically you've got you've got people here who are asking you, you know, <laughs> to explain stuff they didn't understand at school about chemistry, <laughs> um, <coughs> which I think is um, an enormous compliment. So that basically these questions started arriving about two thirds of the way through. So people have basically decided that. Yeah, A, this woman knows what she's talking about, and B, I think I'm going to understand it. So here's the first one. <laughs> um, this one is, I never understood moles and molarity at school, 
please could you tell me what these even mean? <laughs> All right, okay. So the word mole is short for gram molecular. And we just happen to know that if you look in the periodic table, you look at the, the big number, the mass number, and you convert it to grams. So let's say you wanted to um, take some carbon and you looked at the big number and it said 12 if you convert that to grams, you now know you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon in your 12 grams. And the nice thing is that that works for every single atom in the periodic table. Um, if you see like 0.5, I might have to go into that in a bit more detail in the periodic table, but so sodium 23, 23 grams of sodium don't don't hold that in your hand, but 23 grams of sodium would contain 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. And luckily for you, since you were at school, the definition of, mol of moles has changed. And so that is the definition of one mole is now 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 of something. It could be shoes, it could be atoms. Yeah, that's what a mole is. It's kind and of a universal so construct. With um, the maths numbers that you see in the periodic table. Do you know what? I understood that. Thank you. Great. <laughs> and so the final one. Um, here we go. This is an interesting one, actually. I've wondered this a lot myself. Um, we read that life is carbon based, obviously. Um, what does that mean? And what's the deal with carbon? Oh, OK. Carbon so well, funnily enough. Carbon. Sorry, say again. Yeah, so go on. Why is life carbon based? Based. Yeah, it's, it's funny, actually, I was um, in the second year of GCSEs and, and I can remember like two, two questions from my GCSEs. One was about plasmid DNA, which was a fascinating new subject back in 1990. Um, but also um, there was a question about imagine if there was another life form that, um, that uh, was discovered in the universe that was based on silicon. And the reason why they chose silicon is because it's in group four in the periodic table like carbon. And it does have the ability to form chains, so to catenate. So like I said, carbon can form four bonds, each carbon, and then that means that another carbon could join on and, and a chain can have little side branches sticking out. And so the, the variety of side branches that you can have, if, if one, of, one of you, you're, you're in a chain, so two, your arms are, are busy, but your legs can do something else. They can like um, d d d hang on to something else or like, a, 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 I don't know, it sounds a bit acrobatic now, this acronym, this metaphor, but, um, but silicon can do the same. But the trouble is silicon atoms don't hold together in very long chains. Whereas carbon can form chains which are 20,000 carbons long um, in, in things like nylon and things like that are, are just super mega long chains or collagen, super mega long chains. Um, and so that's a unique property that carbon has, which allows a variety of chains that can fit together, curl up, roll up, twist up um, and attach to different things in so many different ways. Rina, thank you. Um, and I said that was the last question, and it was. So for you, my friend, your labours are over. But let me just leave you with this. Um, just come through, um, and it reads, I wish you'd taught me at school. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? That's, um, thank you. That's really great. Well, I'll, I'll try, try and teach a few children, and they can teach, teach you back home. Yeah, we'll so, do that. Katrina, thank you for that. Um, really, um, absolutely fascinating. And... I introduce you as chemistry teacher extraordinaire, ladies and gentlemen, you know why. Um, so, Katrina McGrath, daughter, mother, and aunt of old Vaughanians and Vaughan teacher yourself, thank you very much for the Vaughan lecture. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thanks for coming along. <laughs>